This is a test of the emergency kaiju system. Please re uh, go to your designated evacuation area as soon as possible in a calm and orderly fashion. This is only a test. The alarm will the alarm will sound twice if the threat is real. Reminder: This is only a test. And welcome to the Channel Chasers Podcast. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> welcome to the second episode of the new year and our first official like full discussion episode of the of the new year. And let me tell you, we are starting off with a monster. That's right, folks. We are finally braving the world of Apple TV Plus and talking about Monarch Season 1. As always, I'm your host, Jay, and joining me are my friends and uh, fellow kaiju researchers, Brian and Tony. How you doing tonight, fellas? Doing all right. Hey, people. How, how's it going? Uh, second episode, and we're already running into a little bit of tech issues. The, the video people could not see. Yeah. Oh, YouTube people. Uh, we're ba I, I'm, I'm basically going to basically gonna be in avatar mode from this point forward because uh, unfortunately, my faithful servant Camera Coon has died. So right, we're we're just gonna stick with Avatar mode uh, for the foreseeable future. Cause honestly, it's a it's a good it's a good form of branding because it, it helps remind y'all th this is where uh, this is my avatar everywhere. So it's a nice form of uh, reinforced branding, and it looks nice. Feels feels kind of weird for me though, cause uh... look we look if we if we could maintain the grid without you being without you having to put your camera camera up we would brian but that's just how discord works uh but speaking of brian and uh focusing on brian we can't start an episode without first jumping right into the news with brian okay so uh a little bit of a disclaimer before we get into it uh because apparently now that the strike is over everybody wants to do their award shows the emmys have already happened but considering that we just did a whole thing where we went to whole detail and all that uh don't think it's wise for us to do it two weeks in a row so look it up if you want. There were it was basically how the Golden Globes went with few changes here and there. Uh, we will cover the Oscars when that comes around, but just for variety's sake and also so we're not here forever, thought I'd discuss something else for today's one news topic. All right. And for our one news topic today, it's kind of a little bit of a compound, but it's all about the same movie, and that is the live action How to Train Your Dragon. It has started filming today. Okay, well, cool. Technically, I think it was yesterday as a film. Gotcha, gotcha. But, and it's set to come out in 2025. And thing of note is, this is the same director as the trilogy. Mm. So, guy knows what he's doing. Uh, previously, it, it had been announced that Hiccup was going to be played by newcomer Mason Thames, who is most notably known for uh, that uh, Ethan Hawke horror movie, The Black Phone. Oh, I heard good things about that one. He was the main kid in that. And then playing Astrid, which was also previously announced, is uh, Nico Parker and uh, she was Sarah in The Last of Us. Oh. The TV show version. Yeah. yeah. A and recently we had two other casting announcements. Okay. One, Gerard Butler is returning. Nice. To play Stoke It. Is that Hiccup's dad? I don't remember Hiccup's yes. dad's actual name. Okay. Yeah. I thought yeah. so. And then also uh, for Gobber, the dragon trainer. Yeah, yeah. They didn't get the reprising role, but they did get someone pretty good. Okay. Nick Frost. Nice. Who doesn't love Nick Frost? So. Even though live action based on animated hasn't always been the best, I'm a little bit more hopeful about this as compared to the others. Yeah, same. I mean, it's the same. It's, it's the same person involved. Like, yes. it's it's not like the Avatar situation where every time there's a live action one, the creators are involved and then eventually bounce because whatever company is behind the live action doesn't want to listen to them. Yeah, but this movie, the How to Train Your Dragon live action, mm -hmm. is going to be specifically written. And directed by Dean Dubois. Excuse me. I believe that's how you say his name. I think it's Dubois. Okay. Dean Dubois. And uh, as far as I know, it's not Dean Dubois and somebody else. He is exclusively the only one writing it and the only one directing it. Nice. So, no uh, too many cooks situation. Good, good. Cool. But, uh, that's our news. I also thought that it was kind of a little bit oddly thematic with our show. Because mm -hmm. giant creatures. Yeah, fair. Mm -hmm. But, uh, that's it for the news. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, now, uh, you can't see me, but I am checking my watch because it's that time once again. It is screen time. Screen time, for those of you who are brand new to the podcast, is the segment where the boys and I discuss all the different pieces of media that we've been consuming in between podcasts 
podcast episodes that can range from video games, TV shows we don't have time to cover, movies we don't have time to cover, books, uh, podcasts, uh, like other podcasts we're listening to, uh, different YouTube series we, that have caught our eye, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm going to start off because I got some shit to say. Book talk? What the fuck? Are y'all all right? Dark romance girlies, are y'all all right? Are y'all okay? Because, all right, so backstory. Brian had told me Ooh. about uh, like a, a book series that has had like dark romance book talk in a chokehold. At first, and, uh, I, I paid it no mind because Brian like underplayed it. But then- Well, uh, mm-hmm. I did describe one scene to you. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it was fucked. I thought it explained enough, but yeah, but apparently yeah. not so. I mean, it did. But also uh, a friend of mine, she shall remain nameless, uh, like sold me on it, uh, like with a pitch. And the book, it's a, the book is called Hunting Adeline. So trigger warning, tons, tons and tons of trigger warnings. Uh, this is trigger warning the novel. Uh, basically, without YouTube getting mad at me, uh, there's a lot of stopping traffic. There's tons of t- uh, stopping traffic and, you know, getting rid of the people who, you know, enforce trafficking being a thing, you know, holding up the, uh, forcing, causing the gridlock, as it were. Uh, and, wink, uh, wink, nudge, nudge. and yeah, it's just as like the stuff described in here is just as heinous and disgusting as you can imagine. Maybe even more so. Like it's gotten to the point where like I'm hate reading. I'm on book two and I'm just sitting here waiting for these despicable pieces of human garbage to finally get their just due and like, you know, be ended slowly and inhumanely. It's very well written. I One thing I will not give the, like I will not shit on this book for. It is very well written, but like I'm also super uncomfy, which is the point for sure. I feel like it would be much more concerning if I was comfortable when reading slash listening to this book or these books. But like, dog, this this is crazy. Book talk is wildin', yo. Like I thought they were wildin' before when they recommended me that other thing, that other series. Uh, but like this is crazy, y'all. Like absolutely insane and unhinged and like seriously, book talk. Are you okay for real? That's my big question. Uh, other stuff that I've been getting into. Uh, uh, I I mentioned it previously, but I didn't really go into detail about it. Uh, cause I mean it was technically just piggybacking off of Brian's, but I did start Delicious and Dungeon last week, which is fantastic. Uh, I've been officially added to the homie queue. Uh, we're gonna watch it a couple days after filming this episode, so you know I'm looking forward to that. Uh, also, uh, I finally decided to start watching the One Piece anime uh, week to week, which is something I have not done in like literally 20 years or 15 no 15 years yeah 15 that 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 that's correct math but uh i'm really excited for this arc that we're both currently in in the manga and the anime has just started uh so i'm covering that and i'm like doing reviews over there on tiktok uh i also saw uh the the next subject of uh coverage for our uh, for the podcast next week so i won't spoil what it is because brian will announce that at the end but i really enjoyed it uh and i think you know it's going to have a lot of uh, fun talking points to discuss when we get to the episode. But that's pretty much it. Rant over. Seriously, though, what the fuck with this series? All right, passing it on to Brian. Brian, what pieces of media have you consumed in between podcast episodes? Well, I got on my TV trend because we were focused on getting out the podcast after I was editing, so I didn't have as much editing. So I got on my, like, binging shit again. And uh, I watched the last two episodes of NCI Sydney. Uh, They were really good. One focused more on the cool medical guy and was your like go to every like procedural nowadays have to have one. Uh, bomb threat episode uh, where one of the leads is caught gotcha, in the gotcha. radius, possible radius. But it took some cool twists and turns with it. The the second one is obligatory for NCIS. Uh, they had their first uh, undercover episode and where one of the team has to go undercover. Hmm. It happens with all the NCISs. Uh, I think uh, Los Angeles did it on a regular basis. Uh, Homeboy from um, Fast 3, he was in New Orleans, and I think his character... Oh, Tokyo Drift dude. Yeah. yeah. He was in NCIS New Orleans. He was really good in it, but his character was no more thanks to, I believe, an undercover thing. Ah. But in this one, we really th- we learned more about the B team, especially the uh, female half, who is the local, because in the A team and the B team in this, we have one who's local Australian 
Foley and one who is American NCIS. Oh. And in this one, we get to learn more about her and it focused more on the B team, which was really cool. Then I watched Reacher. Was, I want to marathon it. Uh, I like it. And if I have enough time and uh, moons and all that, I possibly want to uh, get out a uh, review for you guys for season two. Since uh, these guys let me know that it probably never in the future for the main cast. Yeah, we're just, um, Tony and I at least, uh, just aren't personally interested. But, yep. but you know, we encourage solo content around here. Uh, Tony and I have done solo shit, so. And Brian ha yeah. Brian's Twisted Metal review did very well. Thank you guys for supporting that. Um, yeah, which, shit, I forgot to mention that in the year-end wrap-up. Oh, well, we forgot several things. Yeah, we were, we, we were like, we were like Danny and the Iron Fleet. We kind of forgot. Yeah, Maybe. but, uh, but, uh, season one of Reacher, by the way, just real quick, is more of a vigilante, uh, former military company comes into a small town, helps them out with their problem type situation. But season two, season two gets more into Reacher and I think especially Jay might not like season two as much because it's more militaristic and go like flashes back to his time in the military. Mm -hmm. Although I will say because this is uh, like a semi anthology and there's a new cast every time. Uh, in uh, season one, the person that he used to like wisecrack go back and forth with was uh, Clive from iZombie. Yeah. I saw, yeah, I saw, I saw that in the episodes that I saw with my dad. Season two, mm -hmm. the person that he go, goes wisecrack back and forth with is a former military buddy played by Adam Strange from Krypton. Oh shit! Really? Good for him. I like That's that true. actor. Yeah, he he plays kind of the closest thing that the Reacher universe could have to like a U character, Jake. Interesting. To where to where uh, in the past he's like the uh, the playboy of the team. Never said that he's gonna. I like, resent I resent that down. term. Because I've never cheated. He didn't cheat. I know. I'm. Ju I'm just saying. I'm just saying. A lot of girls throw the player label, and I'm like, I have never played anyone. All right. I have been very straight up. I didn't say player. I said playboy. You know what? That's fair. That's fair, Brian. Mm. But but yeah. Uh, I was gonna say the other word, but I don't know if YouTube would allow that. So. Uh. Oh, you. Mean, oh, well. I don't know. Yeah. You're right. Better sure. safe than sorry. But I know what you mean. But anyway, things are a little bit different for him in modern time when he teams up back up with the team. But he's still the wisecracker that he always is and uh we get more into a character who who was a fan favorite from season one and i liking it so far oh um robert patrick uh the t-1000 he is the villain for season two. Oh, cool but it's really cool i'm really liking it not as good as season one but still liking it and i'll get more into detail in a separate video and then lastly i've watched not all but some of the latest episode of uh critical role it's seeming like this is the beginning of the end unless matt throws in the wrench kind of like how he did in the campaign two but uh this seems like this is the beginning of the end for campaign three they're starting their way to get to somewhere big i'll just say that uh this hasn't been the best campaign so honestly for end early i would be okay with either way we'll have to wait and see i did enjoy what i've seen of the episode but campaign as a whole does have its flaws it's my least favorite of the three but anyway without going on for too rambly that's it for me all right so Tony, what pieces of media have you consumed in between podcast episodes? Well, the most notable one is Messed Up Things in Comics and Made Us Go. What the fuck? <laughs> and I watched all 102 entries. Damn. Nice. And you know what they did for one? Uh, it's from the YouTuber Alexander Webb. Shout out to you, sir. What he did for uh, Messed Up Things in Comics 100, he did an mm -hmm. entire review and just showing of Marvel Ruin. For the folks at home, Marvel, Marvel Ruin was a two-issue miniseries showing a world in fucking chaos where... <laughs> I remember Marvel Bruins. Let's just say... It was basically like, to, to give an elevator pitch, it's like mm -hmm. the Marvel Universe, the worst timeline. Yeah, exactly. Everything sucks. Everything is just bad. And uh, like, not there... everything sucks in like the, uh, like that fun TV show, Everything Sucks. No, it's like, uh, the Hulk becomes a giant, uh, amalgamated flesh monster yep and then die. It's like people just die horribly oh yeah like i'm looking at the covers now it's <laughs> yeah 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 no it's very brutal yeah. and uh you'll never guess who wrote that thing who dennis it... oh, of course he hates superheroes why should i not be surprised and a little bit of backstory into that too it, it's kind of a messed up parody of uh what was it you know that whole sprawling story with the art done by alex ross marvels that was yes marvel yeah yeah i i heard this was a parody of marvels so so it essentially is just a two-issue story set in a the 
opposite of Marv, with the same focus character too. Crazy is absolutely insane. Crazy. And then yeah. I also saw his uh, newer series, mm. wholesome comics that made us go, "Oh, that nice." Nice. nice. And, Always need a palate cleanser. Yep. And one of my favorite ones was actually his most recent episode of it, uh, episode eight, well, part eight, where Damien, being Damien, decided to do a mission by himself and get overwhelmed. Bruce saves them. Mm-hmm. Bruce is trying to like, you know, I cannot make this work with you. You don't understand how dangerous it was, but Damien's like, well, I know it is dangerous. So he, Damien, then drops a pearl on the on the table. Mm-hmm. He wanted to get that bit of pearl oh, back. Oh, I know this story. I know yeah. this story. Yeah. This, is, this is the one where he recovers, he, he goes into the sewers, fights Killer Croc to get one of Martha's pearls for his dad's birthday. Yeah, and they share a hug Aww. at the end. Yeah, this was, this uh, was fucking great. Well, to be fair, the, the one that, uh, Alexander show was uh, he was fighting a bunch of goons that were at Gotham Central. Uh-huh. So it's that similar vein, but at least same end result with Bruce is like, oh, you do care. Well, yeah. See, and like that from one of the best Batman and Robin runs uh, and one of the best series mm-hmm. from the New 52, one that actually made me like Damien. It's uh, Peter J. Tomasi and Patrick Gleason's run on Batman and Robin. Uh, and they really understand Damien and make Damien into such a likable character, which is why it was so awesome when Tomasi and Gleason were on Superman back when it was amazing and also they did Super Sons so yeah like mm-hmm. they know how to write wholesome family stuff man like one of my faves is when Damien is like running away and it's a uh, dick who finally catches him mm-hmm. and just like doesn't try to stop him he just talks to him and the reason why he can understand is because he's his Robin yep yeah like you know Br- Bruce was having a tough time connecting to him and then so you know Dick comes after him and he goes how'd you know where i'd be richard and he goes that's easy remember Bru- uh, you may be bruce's robin now but you were my robin first i, I love that shit also in in their batman and robin run there was like a whole issue of just him hanging out with steph and it was the best nice. you get to see nice. steph be uh, like being a big sister and like you know bringing out the goofiness in damien no matter how deep down buried it is i still flashback to that to that webtoon <laughs> yep. of wayne family <laughs> adventures i was promised yeah now, I don't know why it's like don't look at me I was promised ice cream yep. Yep. while Tim and Steph are there in the most horrible yep. the Groucho yeah the Groucho much. class <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but yeah but, tying yeah. it back to what you were talking about Tony mm-hmm. but, I have seen some of this guy's videos and some of the stuff that happens we can't talk about on YouTube that's how bad it is oh yeah oh yeah it is absurd because the uh, in 102 Jay you actually talked about it and it concerns tim oh which one in identity crisis oh uh uh mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. yep, mm-hmm. yep. Mm-hmm. You, you know what i'm talking about jay yeah what happened to his dad mm-hmm. yep yep but the last the last scene of that with Bruce saying i got you yeah oh so wholesome so wholesome wholesome yeah. but everything else about it it was it, it's <laughs> it's super <laughs> fucked because like you know there's wholesomeness to it because you know bruce adopt him and so it's like it's like you know it's much more instant than with dick which is what was like a slow build up to like his legal adoption but also it came at the cost of like just this really fucked up situation yeah cause god damn it people why do you do god damn it boomer 2 no yeah. that was boomer 1 oh yeah it was boomer 1 it was boomer 1 damn it boomer 1 man man was apparently just hankering for a job and, and he he also has low-key harbored a uh, a hatred towards the bat family because everybody else thinks they're cool when they use boomerangs but they make fun of him <laughs> yeah it, it's just rather unfortunate other than that uh I haven't seen anything new that i haven't talked about already okay cool. okay but uh i will say one thing that brought a bit of nostalgia to me that i listened recently it's music related mm-hmm. i listened to a the only time that carlos santana collabed with chad kroger oh, oh yeah. yeah and that that song's a bit of nostalgia for me because i like listen i listened to that song in my teen years i'm like, sorry oh, whenever, yeah. whenever you say whenever you say santana. carlos santana i think of my i think of my skeleton <laughs> he's 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 a legend. But yeah, uh, a legend. Uh, speaking about music, uh-huh. I keep forgetting to mention something to you, Jay. Hmm. In the last 
last week's episode, I said something that was completely wrong. Okay. Oh. I said that we probably wouldn't get any new music from Ariana. What? Oh, uh, Ryan? Ryan? She has a new song out. Okay. <laughs> What's this called? Yes, and. Word. Okay. Uh, also, Tony, did we miss the Blaziken raid? We did, didn't we? I, I don't Maybe we did. I don't know. We'll look into that. Uh, speaking of that, but it's going to come back eventually, so no worries there. Yep. But speaking of Pokemon, Jay and I played through Scarlet and Violet Epilogue. Yeah. Mayhem. It was super weird. It was like a it was a zombie kind of thing involving like mochi produced by a shithead Pokemon. Yep. And Pokemon's YouTube channel graciously gave us the backstory of our mythical for Gen 9, which yep. is Petra Run. Yep. Pretty cool. So basically just to speed run it, it is the story of Momotaro, but everything is in reverse. Yep. Where where the Oni is the good guy or good girl. Um and uh the the uh, the dog, pheasant, and monkey, and the peach are all dickheads. Oh no! You want to know the like the full story behind Petcheron? Oh, I did. I didn't actually watch the video. Yeah, go ahead. So here's the basic premise: Petcheron was taken care of by two old people, and mm -hmm. these are the greediest old people you'll ever meet. Okay. So they just demand and want, and they make Petcheron basically give them everything, mm -hmm. which develops in its own mind that oh, my, the people who take care of me will only love me if I give them things. Oh, uh, okay. That explains a lot. Yeah, well when these entitled old people tell Petron, oh, these four masks that I heard that are in Kitakami, give us those masks, please. Oh, no. Get us those masks. That's our wish. So that's when Petron decide to get its companions of Okie Dogi, Monkey Dory, and Fessendipity. And they travel to Kitakami to get the masks. Yep, and we know the rest of the story from there. Okay. Interesting. And it's uh, on the YouTube channel for Pokemon. So you can see this whole five minute long video. I'm excited. I'll check that out for sure. And the anime for when uh, Ogre Pond mm -hmm. fights the Loyal Three and Petron, it goes hard. Nice. Nice. Like, nice. she goes insane. Being the shit out. Okay, mind you folks, Ogre Pond, depending on what masks she wears, oh, well, she's a pure grass type, but it's her secondary type, is depending on the mask she wears. Mm -hmm. So she fought four poison types as a grass type. Yeah. And beat the asses. Oh, yeah. She, yeah, Ogre, I, I love Ogre Pond. Ibaraki, Ibaraki is my baby and, mm -hmm. and I loved rubbing it in Kieran's face mm -hmm. oh but the story of Mochi Mayhem was actually quite entertaining in itself yep Arvin a lot of Ar 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 <laughs> the, the, the commentary we had was just Arvin being a little petty bitch <laughs> yeah he, <laughs> he was jelly because oh main character main more friends but I'm the bestest friend yeah like it was, it was it's like it's like the, the analogy I made is it's like when you, a jealous girlfriend meets your work wife for the first time oh my god that's funny which oh, you know, and... i have a story i have a story about that but i'll tell the guys off camera oh, okay. my god. Uh, oh but most one of my favorite things mm -hmm. after playing through the event and then just kind of seeing everyone else's thoughts uh -huh. i saw a video by hybrid hero where he's like they don't everything else there's so many questions there are a Why? lot of questions still. I don't, yeah, I have a lot of questions. There, there's so many questions, but for me, at least some, well, one of the major questions that's not answered is how the Loyal Three came back to life. I just inferred it as... I took that as Kieran's negative energy, like, yep. sparking that. Yep, negative energy Cause mixed like, with cause... the terrestrial power of the mask that he had. Because, like, he was holding the mask, he was feeling all that, like, pent-up aggression, punched the thing, and they came to life. So, like, pretty much, That's my, like, makes sense. I accept that theory. That makes the most sense to me. Because, folks, nothing has to be overly complicated to basically get the narrative across. It's just Pokemon, y'all. It's just Pokemon. Yeah, and if Pokemon wants us to infer certain things and make our own interpretations, I think that's cool. That's fine. We don't have to have things fed to us. But yeah, is that so is that it for you, Tony? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, cool. So, moving on from screen time, it is time for Trailer Talk. <laughs> Trailer Talk mm. is a segment of the podcast where Brian has curated a brand new uh, whole playlist of six, count them, six trailers for us to react to and then give our rapid fire thoughts on. So, Brian, uh, and also you can find that playlist in the description down below. Uh, linked thanks to Brian again. Uh, Brian, tell the folks at home what trailers we'll be reacting to tonight. Well, uh, oddly enough, tonight it's mostly movies. All right. Yeah. But that's just how things happen. Uh, 
first of all, shit, my thing is messing up on me. Uh, but, uh, anyway, starting off is a movie that is a, it says that it's a sequel to a movie that came out last year. Mm -hmm. the, the movie was called Concrete Utopia. Never saw it. Never even heard uh, of it. it. It was a South Korean movie. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, it told the story about this, seemed like it was a disaster movie that told about, like, earthquakes that were destroying the, the world. I'll watch a disaster sold. movie as long as Roland Emmerich isn't involved. Well, see, here's the thing. Is this movie is called uh, Badlands, uh, Badland Hunters. And okay. It says that it's a sequel to it, but I think it's a sequel in like universe. Oh, only. in in the fact that it's in the same world. Yeah. Mm. But this one, this one actually stars uh, Gilgamesh from uh, Eternals. Oh, cool. Ma Dong Siok, who uh, first came to fame in uh, Train to Busan. Yep. Ooh. And uh, this tells the story of like the aftermath. It's like basically survivors, uh, like trying to you know live their lives and ruin earth ruined earth yeah cool in a ruined apocalyptic earth uh he plays uh a uh, relentless wasteland hunter nice and unlike the original this one is actually coming to netflix cool most of our stuff today is netflix all right but uh this next one is peacock peacock but and it's one of the it's one of the only uh tv one of the two tv shows and this one is also korean it is called a bloody lucky day it, from the plot it basically kind of reminds me of uh y'all ever see the the uh jamie fox movie collateral yeah it's kind of like that where a uh unknowing uh taxi driver picks up and brian uh you let go of the button like midway through that all we heard an unknowing taxi driver picks up a and then it's cut well can you hear me now yeah yeah he picks up an assassin and shit goes wild from there oh damn mm. but yeah that seems interesting also it's to my knowledge one of the first uh sorry no this isn't peacock this is paramount that yeah, i misspoke early my bad oh good uh but this is one of the first like Paramount K dramas that I've seen, so interested to see what happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then um, y'all ever see the Guy Ritchie movie, The Gentleman? Yes. Well, uh, Guy Ritchie is doing a TV show spinoff. Oh, cool. I mean, fucking uh, like Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie's movies have a lot of style to it, so I, I'd mm -hmm. be I'd be super interested. The Gentleman's a fun movie. This one mm -hmm. stars uh, none other than uh, our favorite romantic time traveler. Uh, Theo James. Nice! I'm glad he found work after Time Traveler's Wife, which, seriously, I wish there would have been a second season. Like, I, I liked that show. Uh, in case you didn't know, he was also in the second season of, uh, of, uh, White Lotus. Oh, cool. That was a show but I've always one, been meaning to check out. This one, it also features Vinnie Jones, <laughs> Ray, Ray Winstone. I'm sorry, every time I, every time I hear his name, I just instantly think, I'm the juggernaut, bitch! Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. But it looks interesting. Nice. Uh, also Netflix. Cool. Uh, also Netflix. Um, players. It is a rom com about a female journalist, a female sports journalist, journalist who uh, typically treats her romantic life like she's running plays. Okay. And then one of the people that she's playing plays on, things get more intense. Oh. Mm -hmm. And that's the premise. But also the cast. Mm -hmm. The journalist Gina Rodriguez. Nice. No. Noise, noise. The male love interest, Tom L. What? Yo, I'm here for Tom. Hell yeah. Pun intended. Jane, Jane the Virgin and Lucifer are two, in the com Two com CW Netflix. legends. Or actually, no, it, it, Lucifer wasn't CW technically. Uh, but I count it because they, they fucking put Lucifer in the era multiverse. I count it. But then probably the, the biggest trailer mm -hmm. uh, that came out, it's uh, for a movie on Netflix called Spaceman. Spaceman. An astronaut sent to the edge of the solar system to collect mysterious ancient dust finds his earthly life falling to pieces. He turns to the only voice who can help him try to put it back together. It just so happens to belong to a creature from the beginning of time lurking in the shadows of his ship. Oh no, Tony, you know what You know what this is, right? Oh no. This is a space exploration to find void dust. Oh no. And he, well, end, uh, and he ends up partnering with Foe. Jesus Christ. Right. It, it, it's madness. 
and well, it's, it's a very people interesting, you'll know. Mm-hmm. This is a very interesting cast, though, which is probably why it's one of the biggest trailers of the week. All right. Uh, and playing the technician is uh, Kamal, Kamal Nayar, also known more popularly as, as uh, Raj from Big Bang. Nice. Uh, playing the astronaut's wife is Terry Mulligan. Oh, wow. Who, great Gatsby, Drive. Yeah, yeah. She was fucking great as Daisy. But the thing that I will always remember her from is her debut. What was her debut? She was the she was the lead in a very particular Doctor Who episode. Which episode? Blink. What the fuck? Yo, that's one of my favorite Doctor Who episodes of all time. Yo, and when I say that she was the lead, this was a Doctor Light episode. Yeah. So Holy she shit. really was the lead. That's crazy. But uh and uh playing the voice is Paul Dano. Nice. But the astronaut himself, Adam Sandler. Huh. Oh. And it's bearded Adam Sandler. Oh, so oh, so this is like serious dramatic Adam Sandler. Like uncut gems, mm. Adam Sandler. Yes. Oh shit, I gotta see this this uncut like mm-hmm. bearded sandler make fantastic movies and then the last the last one which is a movie but not as netflix is it wait is the adam sandler one uh netflix as well he does yep. have that netflix deal yes let's go i finally um, don't have to fucking go to a theater for this march 1st awesome awesome mm. but uh this last one is called abigail it is about a uh, a group of kidnappers who uh, are hired to kidnap this uh rich guy's daughter but then it takes a turn and I'll keep that a surprise. Ooh, suspense. But, but the little girl herself is uh, Matilda in the uh, latest Matilda musical. Oh, cool. But mm-hmm. the other cast, the adult cast mm-hmm. include, get this, Dan Stevens. Oh, shit. Catherine Newton. Oh, shit. Uh, Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant? Mm. Like the NBA player? No, like the actor. Oh, I was uh, like... He, he's known for, uh, he was the big guy in uh, The Strain. He's oh. also in Lost. Oh. He was Blob in the shitty yeah, yep, Wolverine yep. movie. Yep. Got you now. Got you now. But he's a good actor. Um, Giancarlo Esposito. Is he? A, oh, so he's the bad guy. Uh, he's the. It looks like he's the leader of the kidnappers. Mm. <laughs> of course. <laughs> the, and then also, the, there can't be something where Giancarlo Esposito is not a criminal or some kind of villain. Actually, also, um, not true. He wasn't something that he played a good guy in. Okay. To be fair, it was in an episode of Creep show where he played a sh- where he and Tobin Bell basically teamed up to fight a sludge monster. Okay, fair enough. He's got one. Also, um, Bladescope? He's still a- I said criminal. Okay. I said criminal uh, I and or you. some kind of villain. I hear you. But the last person in this cast has- is sadly passed away but they filmed this before they passed Lance away. Lance No, uh, August Cloud. Aw. Angus Cloud! Damn. Angus Cloud. Sorry, my bad. Damn. Angus Cloud. That one still hurt. But, but yeah, uh, his mom is like actively suing somebody right now. Yeah, uh, yeah I've, I've been following it. I, be, I believe that they're trying to find the uh, the dealer. Also, um, I think she's doing something illegally with uh, um, the stuff that happened with his father. Ah, mm-hmm. makes sense. But uh, Poor woman. Yeah, hard to go out to her. Mm-hmm. But yeah, looks but like a very interesting batch. Uh, we'll be back in a second, uh, thanks to the magic of editing. Uh, but for now, uh, tune into this word from our non-existent sponsors. And we're back. Two episodes in a row in the new year and Brian has delivered with some great trailers. Mm-hmm. Honestly, this time even more so because there isn't one where we felt super uncomfy and wanted to skip. Well, I mean, we mm-hmm. felt super uncomfy about one, but we're going to watch it. Well, me and Tony yeah, felt yeah. super uncomfy. And that Which, one, uh, my bad. Go ahead, Brian. I was going to say, I did feel uncomfy too. And also, uh, before we get into that, just real quick, mm-hmm. there was uh, there was one other trailer that I cut for bigger trailers. Okay. And uh, it talked about your other uh, ick. Clouds? Yeah, no, um, water. Uh, oh, deep water. It's, it's, oh. called, it's called Don't Look Up. And what it what it is about is it's about a plane that crashes, but it crashes in the ocean. So the like crew and uh, passengers are stuck in the ship, and it's deep underwater surrounded by sharks. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> ah, fuck. But, but instead of that, we got... Adam Sandler and a talking fucking Big creepy Big unsettling massive tarantula in space. In space. In space. 
Which, like, so to, to explain what Brian was saying about my other ick, I explained during the trailer that, like, I am absolutely terrified of two specific environments. The vacuum of space and deep ocean. I am terrified of water that I cannot see the bottom of. And, yeah, you combine spiders and space and, like, a claustrophobic space story, I'm gonna be scared. Like, I was, I was, like, on the edge of my seat in panic mode when I watched Gravity. Like, but now add big spider. <laughs> A talking spider, by it the way. It looks too real, bro. <laughs> it looks way too, too real. real. When I saw that thing, these these men will tell you. I like. Oh. <laughs> Listen, I was yeah, like, I was you right there with were. you. I was right there with you. I was you. freaking out, but silently. There, there's no, there's, I, there's no I hate spiders. There's no way to silently freak out for me when you see something that fucking huge. Yes. <laughs> no. Kill it. Cause with y'all. Fire. Y'all, if y'all didn't see it, it was like the size of like one of those like It was the size of a small horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, no, I'm okay. And then on top of that, you've got existential Adam Sandler. Which I'm here for that. Like bearded Adam Sandler. The beard is the signal for Adam Sandler movies when you know it's game time. So like I still want to watch it, but I'm going to be in panic mode the entire film. Because if you ever want to see if you ever want to see like beard adam sandler when he's funny but it's still really good uh another thing that i forgot to mention in our year in wrap up you are so not invited to my bat mitzvah oh, oh yeah i remember you said you checked that one out he plays her dad yeah yeah and he's really good in it it's a more Excellent. comical role for him but he still has the beard nice nice oh but anyway he... this one sorry, yeah Tony. uh i i just want to mention something that was really funny and it concerns adam sandler mm-hmm. apparently mm-hmm. a netflix movie where he plays an animated chameleon did better. Oh, oh, oh yeah. you're talking about the one where he plays the turtle. Leo. I thought he Leo. played a turtle. No, no Leo. Um, someone else plays the, the turtle. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, it did better than he Wish. Because better get, than cause guess what? I will still say it. This year, last year, I'll say it to my dying days. Wish is a piece of garbage that shouldn't have existed. How dare you? How dare you use this to celebrate 100 Hundred years of glorious animation. By the way, the turtle. Yep. Was Bill Burr. Oh, that that's that's oh, fantastic. Yeah. Bill Burr is hilarious. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, in this one, he existential bearded Adam Sandler being unconsensually uh, mind graped by by a giant talking spider whose voice is a very calm Paul Dano, which is more that's unsettling. Dano? Yeah, that was Paul Dano. Ooh. Yep. Yes. Oh no. <laughs> Giving off very uh vibes of uh how. Yep. Uh, only that coming much. out of a spider's man. Yeah. Body. Spider's it, it's a, like yeah, no. Paul punch. Dano Paul, Paul Dano is going to after this film going to be the voice of my nightmares. Uh, the, mm-hmm. it, spider will live rent free in my brain along with the zombies and the giant dog. Yep, 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 yep. That um, wasn't the only freaky thing that we saw. Yeah. So holy <laughs> shit, let's talk about Abigail. Oh, yeah. This looks insane. And like the way I described it is basically a bunch of people trapped in a house with fucking uh, fu- uh fucking Camille from uh vamp- from the uh, fucking Vampire Chronicles. So the comparison you made was more so Claudia. From, Not Camille, uh, Claudia. I meant Claudia. Cam- Camille was her companion. Uh, yeah, Claudia well, from Vampire Chronicles. This movie, this movie itself, I uh-huh. didn't tell you off screen, mm-hmm. but uh. Basically, it's a reimagining of uh, the old school monster movie, Dracula's Daughter. Oh, yeah. that's, Jesus a, that's, a, that's a camp classic. But it's like a modern reimagining. It's one of, and, uh, oh my God. It's one of Bela Lugosi's uh, last time to Dracula. But when Maybe. that little girl said, I'm sorry for what's about to happen. Oh yeah, that's super unsettling. Jay, because Tony and I knew what was going to happen and knew the twist, but Jay didn't. Yeah, uh, I'll leave you guys talk for a second. I got, I got, I got to bring i got to bring my dog into my room because she looks tired uh continue though that was crazy though because jay didn't see it coming and he was like what the fuck demon child but this just looks ridiculous because you're having to survive a vampire but it's a vampire little girl it's a ballerina okay so also to add to that i think we forgot to mention these folks kidnapped her well (laughs) 
They kidnapped a vampire! <laughs> they were trying to, but then the house went into lockdown. Because I have a theory. Oh, uh, yeah? I have a theory. Uh, what's that, Brian? That the guy that hired him, hired them, was like her dad. Because oh, okay. to feed the little girl. I mean, the little girl seemed to know what was happening. Oh, yeah. She was aware. I knew that from the jump. Just from the way she <laughs> spoke. So, but, maybe they thought they were, the people in the house knew that they were mm-hmm. going to get cash out of it. But then they realized realize oh fuck <laughs> now we're screwed yeah because just seeing that big dude who's played like the blob and was the hunter dude in uh, the strain just seeing him run scared shitless saying, a a vampire coming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> also jay mentioned this off screen but Catherine newton yet again just yeah good off horror films yeah no like she was great and freaky and she looks to be great in this she she reminds she, me of like the scream character that has like all the meta knowledge come here baby mm-hmm. oh man yes. the, it's funny that you mentioned that jay because this yeah, is yeah directed by the dude who directed the scream pseudo reboot and uh scream 4 yeah honestly people don't like people shit on scream 4 but it's not that bad in the grand scheme of scream yep uh, i definitely agree with on that scream 4 was the pseudo reboot of the franchise they wanted to do the younger cast. Hidden Pantier was in it. it Which was great. She was great. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I will point out is just the visuals of this particular movie look amazing. Oh, yeah. And I can't well, leave the 19th. Oh, yeah. The atmosphere? It's fucking great. I yeah. haven't seen it, but I've heard only good things. It's also the same director as Ready or Not. Oh, I've mm-hmm. heard, yeah, I've heard good things about Ready or Not. But uh, we can continuing the freaky train before we transition to completely different stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, a bloody lucky day. Yeah, what the fuck? It's, it's such a weird premise but like also really I, gripping yeah i, think I heard so that it is based on a webtoon it seems like it oh, definitely comes off as such and yeah. and that's not a bad thing because the, like there are a lot of great thriller webtoons i read a bunch well, also you know what else started off as a webtoon bloodhound yep yeah and that was like what one heard. of our collective favorite like top two yeah tv shows of last year yep yep yep, yep also also just a just a random side note corgis are surprisingly heavy <laughs> Uh, You're gonna go down now? Oh my goodness. Ow. The thing that I definitely have to say about uh, uh, my bloody lucky day is mm-hmm. both characters are in hinge for completely different mm-hmm. Our taxi driver comes off as a, uh, like I said while we were watching the trailers, as a bit of a bit of a nutter. Also, there's a third kind of unhinged character that isn't in the plot uh, synopsis and that's uh, the mom of a murdered kid. Yeah, the murder. That yeah. the guy murdered. Yeah, who is trying to like, basically, she it looks like she'll be like hunting the guy down um oh, like shit. not the n- not just the ta- not the track well yes the taxi driver by association but yeah. since the police are not really taking the case seriously she it looks like she'll be taking it upon herself to track down uh the serial killer dude if she did her own justice for her kid yep because she getting this oh yeah i mean w- i mean can you blame her i mean her son was you know well it also looks like we maybe saw the way that her son was killed and holy Jesus oh yeah can yeah. you imagine if that's how they head. start the episode like Brian you remember all of us are dead how they started that one uh remind me oh you don't remember it was when it, they uh, like so spoilers for all of us are dead if you haven't seen it but the opening of uh the first episode like the first five minutes is like the, the scientist dude like injecting his son oh, with yeah. the injecting his son with uh the what would later uh, be known as the, the zombie virus and like he like falls he like he like falls like several stories and like hits a neon sign and gets back up and starts attacking the bullies that were like fucking mm-hmm. with him well it's just he doesn't fall what happened because now i remember now is uh went to lunge for i think it was his dad or somebody and uh they they were on the building the the roof of this building yep. and the person swerved out of the way and he hit the sign bounced off hit a fire escape 
railing, then hit something else, landed, and then got up and started attacking people, the bullies. Mm -hmm. It was like, damn, pain, human ping pong. Oh, yeah, shit was crazy. But, yeah, if it starts off like that, damn. Oh, yeah. But also, so that we're not here forever. Uh, also from that same country, though. Oh, yeah, that that, that Badlands show? Look intense. Yeah. I'm it's here for all movie. that action. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the movie. Hundreds. Yeah, yeah. It looks pretty, it looks pretty intense. I'm here for it. I'm yep. here. Glad to see that actor doing more. You have just wasted okay. in that shit. We don't need to talk about it. We don't need to talk about it. It doesn't need to be mentioned. It doesn't deserve to be mentioned. But, uh, now for something completely different. Yep. Players. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I love this. I think the concept is really cool. It reminds me of one of my favorite Will Smith movies of all time. Probably my favorite Will Smith movie of all time, Hitch. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> like, I vibe with Gina Rodriguez's character so much. Mm -hmm. And, like, I, so, all right, I'm, I'm exposing my own game here. Uh, but, like, you know how she treats, uh, she treats date like, uh, like a sports place. Playbook. So, yeah. with me, I, in my head, how I operate is, like, I'm the protagonist of a, of a romance visual novel. And it, it it's worked for the most part. Uh, oh, but, yeah, I, I, I love that. Uh, because, uh, very similar to that, I treat, uh, a lot of my friends kind of operate as the, like, supporting side characters who help <laughs> who help in, uh, like move certain routes along uh so like i totally get where she's coming from and like just from those trailers the, the chemistry between uh gina rodriguez and tom ellis is on fire like the only thing that i'm like i don't know if i'm gonna like this is clearly one of the homies caught feelings mm -hmm. that's uh damon wayne jr oh really oh yeah mm -hmm. i knew that i knew that was him he looks you can tell because he looks so much like his fucking dad mm -hmm. um but uh, yeah still Still, though, my favorite thing from him will always be Happy Endings. Ha he was fantastic in Happy Endings, and his dad played his dad in Happy Endings. Yeah, but also, with both him and his dad, he was the married one, which meant that he had an anchor so that neither one of them would get too crazy. She could, like, bring them back and calm them down. Yep, yep, yep. But yeah, that one looks really fun. Uh, we've been and on then, a good we've been on a good streak with, like, rom-com type movies, so looking forward to it. Yep. And <laughs> lastly, is the gentleman mm. the guy that, Richie that show oozes pure style mm -hmm. yeah uh, like the guy the guy Richie influence and hand is right there but like the whole thing of like having the whole guy Richie style last for a whole TV show that's gonna be expensive but also very fun to watch like I oh, still yeah. hold I know a lot of like book purists like hate guy Richie's great Gatsby but I st in my opinion guy Richie's great Gatsby is is the best film adaptation of Great Gatsby we've gotten because only somebody like Guy Ritchie could properly capture the excess of the Roaring Twenties in the way that he did. And plus the way that the book was written, it is a uh, really that exploration into the excess of that time. Exactly. I feel like it matches the point of the movie. But yeah, point is Guy Ritchie is a very stylish director. And like, while it doesn't work for some movies, I'm looking at you, Robin Hood. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It definitely works for stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Um, surprising long list of casts like Giancarlo Esposito in it again. Also Ray Winstone. Yeah, the cast is pretty fucking stacked. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I noticed you guys kept saying, oh, they're in it? Oh, they're in it? Yeah, it's fucking crazy, right? That shit it was loaded. Well. But the style is there and Theo James. Yep. And for, I think, one of the first times actually gets to use his accent. Yeah, usually, usually he plays American. Yeah. Oh, and so, my favorite part of the trailer, uh -huh. the Music. Oh God yeah! Damn. Oh yeah! Like Guy Ritchie, ha like has mastered that cinematic music video style of editing that the original Shitty Suicide Squad tried to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, damn. I think uh, I think it's gonna be like even if the story is mid, visually it's gonna be stunning. And mm -hmm. music will play along with that. Cause fun fact for y'all, one of my favorite songs in my top 100 favorite songs, "Time of Season" is on there. It's a good song. Oh yeah, it is. Great. And it's at uh at least in the top. 50. Good name. Nice. Uh, so yeah, great trailers. Mm -hmm. We missing anything? Did we cover them all? No, we covered all six. Okay, cool. So now it's time to take one giant step into Monster Island because we are here to discuss 
monarch all right so first off like we're obviously gonna start spoiler free but uh this show connects everything like literally mm -hmm. throughout our watch along we're like oh man this is filling in all the gaps what the fuck this is connected to this and that holy shit i remember that from you know godzilla vs kong i remember that from skull island and yeah it's it's crazy and this person is this person from the movies but just in a different, different point in their life yeah it's wild so like yeah. while it's a good show i feel like you'll only really get the full experience if you have seen the uh monster verse stuff like the yep. legendary yes. monster verse stuff yes but also i do feel like no it's a it's still a great show on its own and I think it'll definitely get you yeah. hooked into the legendary verse, but you get the the level of enjoyment we had because I don't want to like falsely advertise it. We got that extra level, that extra kick because we've all seen well, and enjoyed the uh, monster verse films. Well, um, in unfortunately, it's in one of the uh, temp not lost, but uh, on the shell episodes. But I specifically for one screen time caught up on the monster verse because I was behind. But I do think that for this one given the timeline of everything mm -hmm. you could get by with uh just watching uh godzilla the 20 the 2014 one. uh was it not i thought it was it was it 09 was it that long ago yeah. 2014 i was gonna say i thought it was 2014 oh, oh that's right 09 is just one of the times that they go to people. but anyway uh the g-day as they call oh well, yeah yeah g-day is the epicenter of uh like of events for uh for this timeline so yeah definitely all you re all you like all that is like essential is uh 2014 godzilla but yep. you get a lot more flavor if you've seen the other stuff like even surprising ones that you wouldn't expect like uh godzilla versus king kong and uh kong skull island oh yeah mm. which by the way i'm still i'm gonna bitch about it every time i get the chance come on netflix what the fuck happened to dog mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, need to we need to know uh now i tell you if you if you want to really blow our minds what if they include characters? Yo, from... if, if we get May Whitman, if we get May Whitman, like as Annie, but like an older version, and this takes place, oh, it takes place like later in the Skull Island timeline, because we know oh, that, yeah. we know that this shit loves to play around with timelines. We get uh, we get Homeboy from uh, Never Have I Ever to reprise his role as Mike. Yep. Oh shit. That would that'd be, that'd, cool. that'd be fucking awesome. Uh, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were talking about time lines um and uh so we'll still stay spoiler free of course but like this show plays around with two separate timelines one timeline mm -hmm. taking place uh fr like between the 40s to the early 60s and a tad bit into the 80s um mm -hmm. and then our main timeline focuses on uh present present day which is uh 2000 between 2015 to 2017 yep mm -hmm. uh and mm -hmm. uh basically how we're gonna do this discussion is we're gonna talk about both timelines uh but spoiler free wise i think the strongest point of this is uh all of the character work i think all oh, of the characters yeah. were amazing each of them were flawed and mm -hmm. very vulnerable, which made it very easy for mm -hmm. you to root for them. Even though one character is like Tony's like clear favorite because he just loves to dog on this character. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, all of them are great. All of them are great mm -hmm. and uh, very compelling. Uh, and, and, uh, and the other combination. Oh, of, yeah, go ahead, Brad. My bad. I was going to say combination of new and seasoned actors yep. all doing great. And like the biggest thing that, you know, I hope will sell you on this this show does not skimp on the budget you get to see the big nope. g a whole bunch of mutos some mutos we've never seen before in the legendary verse and it's just and some we have it's wild like technically in the universe they're called titans mutos were just oh, the yeah, yeah. uh yeah titans oh yeah yeah you're right my bad uh but my yeah bad. so like Thanks. you're gonna yeah yeah this isn't just a cloverfield type show guys like you get to see the titans in full glory like you see the big g mm -hmm. multiple times like, uh, I won't give any spoilers, but at least one time in the show, one character will go, like, almost literally face-to-face -face with Big G. And we get, uh, like, G we get to 
see G Day from a survivor perspective as well. So that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, uh, anything else we can say that's spoiler free? Because I, I really do want to jump into the, the actual like plot points. It, it's great stuff. Um, got to see uh, why Russell finally play like a likable character that isn't a stoner. He's still kind of a douche, but like a likable yeah, but, douche. Yeah, because um, and the reason why I say that's also not a stoner because before he uh, before he played a uh, buckface in uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, okay. he was known for being a stoner. Uh, oh. He's the lead in that HBO show uh, Lodge uh, Forty Nine. Oh, I've heard of that. It's about like a stoner who takes over and starts working in an old folks home. Ah, oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so uh, any any other last spoiler free comments? Music is. Uh, oh yeah, the mu the score yes. is amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much helps to sell the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. the score is amazing. Everything that's is smart, but not too smart. I also like all the romance plot lines, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about later because there's a lot of mess there. Mm -hmm. And none of the characters are like tenderizing. Yep. And all the com all the characters are very complex. For sure. We'll get in into it in the spoilers. There were some times where we were questioning things. Yep. But yeah, uh, so now, now that we've hopefully, you know, got your interest peaked in Monarch, definitely go check it out. It's on Apple TV Plus. Totally mm -hmm. worth using a free trial if you, uh, you know, haven't checked out Apple TV Plus yet. Or if you already have it, go watch it. It's great. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and give us our usual five count. And we're going to travel into the hollow earth of Spoiler Town. Mm -hmm. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. Spoiler alert. All right, let's begin. Okay, so we're going to start with holy the pre-Monarch timeline, because holy shit. So Lord. as Brian alluded to, we discover, because one of the first things we see is John Goodman's character from Skull Island. And yep. eventually we discover that John Goodman's character from Skull Island is Bill Randa, one of the two founders of Monarch out of the three that we meet in this timeline. Mm -hmm. Man, mm -hmm. yeah. you, you'd think with all the explosions, Exploring he does he he wouldn't have put on weight like that but man i mean now well to be which, fair uh, john goodman has lost a lot of weight so mm -hmm. yeah which we'll get back to that yep uh, uh actually uh the good theory mm -hmm. but uh but yeah Fun fact for you though, uh, the year that the uh, like they start looking for stuff and they like find Godzilla's footprint and all that. Yep. I think it was like fifty nine. No, it, it was that like, is... it, it was like it, yeah, no, it was like fifty five. Fifty three. Well, oh, fifty three. Yeah, because fifty nine was when well, because fifty nine was when uh, uh, the whole uh, Keiko incident happened. No, Keiko oh. two years later. I thought that was fifty nine. Oh, it no. was 50, oh, that was fifty five. Okay, thank you for having the timeline straight, Tony. My bad. But anyway, that is the same year that Godzilla the original came out yep. in uh, 54 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is, which is a nice so, which is a nice tie in I, li I like that a lot um, yep. yeah and it's not our last tie in uh, get into that later yep and uh so we get introduced to our three principal leads for the uh like pre monarch and uh slash establishing monarch timeline which are mm -hmm. Bill Randa uh Keiko Mura which who will eventually become Keiko Randa and Lieutenant Lieutenant Leland, uh, Lieutenant Leland Lafayette Shaw the Third. You got to say the whole mm -hmm. name to put respect on this man's name because he's been through a lot of shit. <laughs> oh Jesus Christ, he has. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's talk about these three. I think honestly, the one that's the most underdeveloped is Billy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because he's just kind of there to show the tension between Keiko and Lee. Yeah. yeah. And we and... get to see, obviously, you know him taking care of Hiroshi and him kind of being a shitty dad to Hiroshi and kind of passing those habits down. Yep. But yeah. other than that, we don't really get much development on Billy, which I think we'll get more of in season two, if there yeah. is one. Yeah. Do we, um, like to, do we know if there is one, by the way? Nope, we don't know yet. God damn it. One thing I love to add, though, mm -hmm. even though we didn't get much development from him, the way he was used was still expertly done. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, to make it indeed. a to the folks at home, even though there wasn't development for a character that's a new he was still a he was still a great addition to the team because uh it really balanced the three of them out because billy mm. was as analytical and scientific as keiko but he was also as excited and like much more of a like fly by the seat of your pants in the moment type of character similar to lee so he was able to vibe with both yeah definitely. but also he keiko is a scientist and lee is a soldier and because 
says he is, he, they both like lean on that and lean on the logical side. And he was the one who was more open to the. Yeah. Like, I, I love the. Extraordinary. Yeah. I love the phrase that eventually becomes Monarch's mantra that, you know, he coined uh, beyond logic lies truth because, you know, mm -hmm. he's a fucking cryptozoologist. <laughs> so, like, you know, all those people are looked at as nutters. So mm -hmm. he's not afraid to look crazy. And because he's not afraid to look crazy, he's able to find out the truth like yeah he discovers the and network by observing ants and a whole bunch of other crazy shit mm -hmm. if you go back and you see uh, kong skull island his character comes off very kind of seems crazy but we find out everything is true yep yep and on top of that one of the most fascinating things about billy is that he survived an attack on the lawson yeah i think it was called mm -hmm. the lawton the lawton the lawton well mm -hmm. it's regardless the point being yep. he's a survivor of a monster attack yep mm -hmm. and, and was in the navy yep and it reminds me of like uh if you if you're familiar with um navy urban legends it reminds me mm -hmm. of uh the philadelphia experiment this uh mm -hmm. whole urban legend about a ship that was in naval station norfolk that got teleported to philadelphia and when the teleportation happened the sailors were like fused with parts of the ship and like yeah yeah shit's crazy and we actually see that type yeah. of shit in the lot and like there are sailors corpses like fused to parts of the hull it's fucking gnarly but also uh that ship that he was in is now mysteriously in uh Kazakhstan or no, it, philippines it was no, the philippines it was in the philippines it was the philippines yeah then Kazakhstan is later yep, yep. and yeah because and and, the, now, and billy and billy's plot line there is a is a good introduction to one of the running themes of the show or at least this season which is survivor's guilt oh yeah yeah and one of the find the most fascinating is that as a cryptozoologist he unknowingly stumbled upon his uh old ship well he was searching for his old ship which i think is the most interesting thing for someone who with that survivor's guilt to actually do yeah because i because well, I, I definitely think you know you know to get into billy's head a little bit i feel like he did that because he wanted to bring closure to his comrades families mm -hmm. so that you know they could at least know what happened to them even if it sounds I, crazy well also an underlying theme with his character is uh trying to prove that he's not crazy mm -hmm. that he saw what he saw yep yep because he was the only survivor people probably didn't believe him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh you know the other running theme of this show is family um and uh billy even though he doesn't have much development he shows uh like he's kind of the backbone of a lot of this in terms of family because his willingness to support keiko and hiroshi and form that family unit is what leads us all the way down to the uh third generation randa family or a uh, technically second because like technically keiko and billy keiko billy and hiroshi would be the first generation randa family um but uh uh, yeah, I think uh, th that's pretty interesting. Uh, and, like, it makes total sense with how driven and dedicated to his research that Billy is, that Billy became neglectful, um, mm. especially considering uh, what we find out about Keiko later, uh, because I'll go ahead and just skip to this. Uh, we find out that Keiko did not die when she mm -hmm. fell into the Hollow Earth portal. We found out she was just stuck in the Hollow Earth. And from because that was revealed it makes me think now billy's obsession wasn't just to find was it wasn't just about muto's it was about finding k mm -hmm. which is why you know obviously because well, billy was her husband but like you know one of the first people keiko is looking for is billy well also uh to double on on that because we do see him afterward after they lose keiko mm -hmm. they're invested in going into the hollow earth with bill and then bill go into the hollow earth you, you, you mean you mean back. you mean Shaw? Oh wait, Billy. Shaw, sorry, Shaw. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, I was gonna say Billy doesn't go in there. Sorry. Yeah, Shaw. Bill Bill gets obsessed even more so because now he's lost his wife and his best friend. Yep. To the Hollow yeah Earth. Hollow Earth. And one of the things.
things that makes me think that like Billy was obsessed with finding K was that uh, the fact that like one of the, the thing that Hiroshi is researching that he picked mm-hmm. up from his father was the, the, the gamma burst signal. And we later find out those signals were being sent out by K as a distress beacon. Mm-hmm. So that's clearly what Billy was searching for and trying to narrow down. Oh, yeah. Um, in, indeed. Yep. And we might get into more of that in yep. the future, hopefully. And, uh, you know, like you said before, Brian, to piggyback off of an earlier point, uh, Bill Billy's descent into, you know, madness, as it were, uh, kind of shows one of the other themes of the show and how trauma shapes people. Mm-hmm. Because, like you said, you know, Billy became upset with the hollow earth and proving everything was real and all that stuff. Uh, and then, you know, down the line, his son Hiroshi became obsessed with this very same thing. But for him, it, he became obsessed with it because he G, because G-Day happened and he was like, well, I want to make sure that another G-Day never happens again. And so, you know, he gets de- super dedicated to that mission to the detriment of both his families. And uh, let's start mm-hmm. talking about that. We're going to mm-hmm. jump to Modern Monarch and talk because... about Hiroshi and this mess. Well, mm-hmm. as a thing, yeah, because Hiroshi was Keiko's son. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so we follow this family down the line. Yeah. And we, so, and at first we think that Hiroshi is Keiko and Billy's biological son, but it turns out that Keiko was widowed during the war and, uh, like, got a scholarship to, uh, study at Berkeley and then secretly snuck, uh, her son over and eventually got a visa for her son and her mother. So, you know, they were technically a secret family and Hiroshi picked up the wrong lesson, apparently, and was like, Mm -hmm. secret family? That sounds like a great idea. (laughs) I, I, for part of my life, didn't have a dad and then I basically had two dads. So now I'm going to have two kids with two moms. Yep. Mm -hmm. He goes, you know, I, I had one family and then I lost it in one fell swoop. So you know what? I'm going to overcompensate. I'm going to have two families. Which, I know this is jumping ahead of time, but we are in spoilers. Mm-hmm. They still didn't answer. No! They didn't. Hiroshi didn't talk about it at all, and that pisses me off. That's my one big negative. I kept yelling at the screen, Hiroshi, explain your secret family. Your kids know about each other now. They're together. Talk. Let them figure we, this out. We do at one point get to see him and get to see him talk, and he like talks about honor and is a very like stoic honor bound kind of guy yet also i'm still very confused on the timeline right because kate's older than kentaro so Mm -hmm. this means that kate's mother was hiroshi's first wife Mm -hmm. but we see that uh, uh kentaro's mother knew hiroshi first so is it a situation of he was married to Kate's mom and then eventually reconnected with Kentaro's mom, fell in love, and then had Kentaro? And since he had regular work in Japan with Monarch, he just formed a family there? Like, why not just... Because, uh, like, okay, so, like, here's my personal headcanon and, like, armchair psychologist thought process between, uh, for Hiroshi and the secret family, right? So how I make sense of the timeline is how I explained it, right? Um, uh, Kate's mom... Mom and Kate were his first family. Like Kate's mom was his first wife. He eventually mm-hmm. recon uh, you know, his work at Monarch has him spend a lot of time in Tokyo. He eventually reconnects with who would eventually be Kentaro's mother. They fall in love, and because Hiroshi knows what how terrible abandonment is, I think he was so focused on not letting Kate feel abandoned by like having a divorce and living on a whole nother side of the world that he decides you know what? No, I travel back and forth between the U.S. and Tokyo all the time for work. You know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to be- abandon either of these kids. I'm going to have two families. That's my Makes personal sense. headcanon for Hiroshi's reasoning behind the secret family until we actually hear it from the man's mouth. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. What do you think, Tony? You think I'm on, you think I'm on, uh, on the spot here?
here? I think you are, man. I honestly think you are. Because yeah. uh, just you describing it makes the most sense to me. All right, cool, cool. So, well, this also could fall in line with the whole thing about uh, Bill coming back, uh, probably reawoken some things within him. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, Shaw. You you keep Shaw. flipping Shaw and Shaw. Bill. Uh, you could keep flipping Damn Shaw it. and Damn Billy. It. Damn it. Yeah. But anyway, but... Shaw coming back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. So now, uh, since we we already started talking about the family, let's talk about the Randa siblings and by extension May, who becomes kind of like entangled with the family. Uh. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. first, I want to talk about Kate. I Kate is honestly my favorite character of the entire show. Um. Because she is the most flawed, right? And because she is the most flawed, I feel like she has the most potential for character growth. Uh. And we see that a lot here. Kate is a terrible person. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like, you know, we see her life free G day and she's like, she's a good person at heart. You know, she tries to save her. Uh, she tries to save her kids, uh, you know, mm -hmm. when the disaster happens and some mm -hmm. massive trauma happens where she's able to get some of them out. But then the bus, uh, the part of the bridge where the bus is on collapses and she has to watch her kids fall to their death. So, you know, screaming on the way down, uh, screaming on the way down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not a full on teacher, but even as a TA, if I had if I saw that happen, that would fuck me up for life. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we see that she also kind of picked up some negative happen uh, some negative habits from old Papa because mm -hmm. we discover that she is also cheating on her uh, her girlfriend at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, but roommate. Yeah. Well, well, also oh. girlfriend. They 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 were clearly dating. Mm -hmm. they no, were... the room that she was staying with before moving in with the girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, what you call? Uh, I just realized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being scared is like a common thing for her because the whole entire reason why, or at least part of the reason why, we find out that she did cheat was because she was scared of commitment. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it's a very common thing. And I think uh, to connect it back to her dad, right? Like I mentioned, I think the reason Hiroshi cheated uh, was not because he was like scared of commitment, but I think he genuinely fell in love and he wanted to further it, but he was scared of ending up like his father and abandoning his children or in specific specifically at the time abandoning Kate and her mother because I'm sure he still loved Kate's mother and like the fact that you know he lost his own mother he doesn't want again to fracture that fragile happiness that they have because you know when Kate talks about Hiroshi it's not like he was a bad dad it's all great no. memories well that's part of the thing with her is because beyond the fact of him like leaving that last time that she saw him he was a good dad that to her was not flawed at all so to find out he has this whole other family yep. is like breaking her mind yep mm -hmm. and uh, like you know we we definitely get to see kate overcome that fear and honestly become a lot more like her both her both of her grandparents because like even more so than kentaro kate is the one to really see truth beyond the logic like she despite everything that's happened to her uh after she actually comes face to face with the big g she realizes that he's not the monster she thought. He's actually our protector. And uh, like, I love that she came to terms with that. I think that was awesome. It was such a good character moment for her. And then also for her, mm -hmm. uh, speaking about the romance department and the romance plot lines, uh, bringing May into this, I think her opening up to May and letting herself fall in love and feel vulnerable is a huge character development for her. Like, you know, I joked around a lot uh, during the watch along that Kate was thinking with her dad, but at the same time, like from a logical standpoint, right? This is Kate actually letting herself experience love. So like, you know, we've all done dumb shit when we we're in love. And that's kind of what Kate did. Doesn't excuse it, the stuff being dumb, but I understand mm -hmm. why she did it. Um, and, you know, going to May real quick in her own, she is kind of the perfect match for Kate because she is also a runner. Um, She, mm -hmm. you know, rebelled against this big tech company that she worked for and just kind of vanished into the wind uh, to protect herself and her family. And then, you know, right when she, you know, saw, uh, like thought that, you know, things were just unstable, she finds a way out in this deal with Monarch, but then she grows to care for Kate in particular. And that's what anchors her back into, no, I'm not gonna, like, I'm not gonna do this anymore. Uh, like, I I'm, I'm done, I'm done with all this, like, cloak and dagger bullshit. So I, again, I appreciate that character development from May as well. Uh, oh, yeah. Yep. So yeah, you guys have anything to add mm -hmm. on uh, Kate? May not like her as a person, but her character growth, I will agree, it is good. Still don't like her as a 
person though fair brian i i, I totally get that but i think i think at least for me by the end she did redeem herself i agree um she talked her mom oh, well grandma sorry off of a proverbial ledge and uh and like said, and, no uh-huh go ahead this curse on our family yeah is not going to end here i have lost a lot to the hollow i am not losing you and i only just found you also like the thing that really redeemed a character for me by the end was her mm -hmm. fully acknowledging all of her family like mm -hmm. uh i mean but uh, this was on both kentaro and kate's end so i can't put this all on kate but like they were each very cold to each other for a good chunk of the season i mean rightfully so because you know they both respectively found out that their father had a secret child uh, uh but like mm -hmm. the moment that really like redeemed kate's character for me was when she introduces keiko to kentaro and she says um kentaro i'd like you to meet our grandmother uh this is my brother i was like oh that's great i love that because mm -hmm. kind of the same can be said for kentaro for me his character was really redeemed when you get to see him in his most at his lowest point and at his most vulnerable when he breaks down and just again that feeling of survivor's guilt feeling like he couldn't save his sister and mm -hmm. may and he acknowledges kate as his sister and as his family mm -hmm. and that was just that moment was beautiful mm -hmm. i agree with yeah. that and, and sure uh, I he poked fun at him for being a, a bit of an idiot himself oh yeah and one of the things that i would say that out of the random kids i felt bad for their circumstances but i also can see how flawed as individuals they are because of the way that oh yeah well like papa you know and, and, yeah. like, and like brian brought up earlier right like uh both kids honestly had this like flawless image of their dad but like mm -hmm. i feel like kentaro even more so because like uh you know uh hiroshi encouraged like kentaro's actual like off the beaten path career choices he didn't want kentaro to be a software engineer yeah. or you know do what he does he want he encouraged kentaro to be an artist he was there for every show and you know which is why it took much longer for kentaro to mm -hmm. actually come to terms with the fact that hiroshi is was a very flawed man like he yeah. in the beginning was like hiroshi's number one champion whereas kate was already processing it and moving through anger and all the different stages of grief being like no fuck him he was like no 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 there has to be a reason he had to have done this for a reason we have to find him to find out he can explain this to us to eventually by the end he's like no there's no explanation this is all fucked fuck you i need to figure this yeah. out on my own if you're not gonna do it i'm gonna do it myself mm -hmm. which is why out of the leads he's probably my favorite oh yeah, yeah my favorite my favorite character overall is best mom but out of the leads it's uh Kintaro. i gotta because, say Kintaro, yeah. yeah like to, to talk about side characters real quick Kintaro's mom is the most mature lady i have ever seen in my life yeah, yeah i definitely agree mm -hmm. like she discovers that her husband had a secret child and her reaction isn't to be angry she instantly welcomes kate with open arms like helps calm her down during a panic attack and her question isn't like you know why the fuck did he cheat her, her first question is you know what was your life like you know how was hiroshi as mm -hmm. a father to you i, I to love i love story. that but at the same time we do also get to see her process it as well and her to finally her finally letting out her own frustration and anger towards the situation because she has every right to be just as angry as the kids yeah but also showing kentaro that the anger won't help us yep exactly like we can be as angry as we want that won't change the situation also speaking but... of other side characters i want to briefly mention i think kate's mom knew about the secret family i think so too uh, which is why mm -hmm. she was so cagey about kate going to japan and mm -hmm. going to that apartment and uh let's be honest why she was so quick to move on yeah she was probably al already like kind of uh like not dating but she was definitely already like planning on uh like eventually divorcing hiroshi uh when she had a valid mm -hmm. uh you know a valid reason to kind of break it to kate she obviously didn't want kate to find out like this which is why she was so worried but she definitely knew because like i have a feeling when we do finally get to meet kate's mom and have her interact with hiroshi it's going to be just as mature and mm -hmm. i think she's gonna be angry but more so angry at him for letting her letting kate find out this way yeah because because uh 
the thing is, is uh, when Hiroshi's mom, uh, no, her, when Gintaro's mom mm-hmm. finally confronts Hiroshi, that scene, because she's just like, you think that she's going to take him back, and she's just like, we will keep a civil relationship and we put to each other, but only for our kid. Yeah. And- you are not living here, but and when you do, when you do find a new place, let me know so that our son can know. Yep. And I, because and I, her biggest focus is Kentaro. Yeah. And I think that's the same for Kate's mom. And mm-hmm. because we were seeing things from Kate's perspective, we got a very skewed view of Kate's mother. But I think because she was the first wife, she has a much clearer understanding of who Hiroshi is as a person mm-hmm. and loves him regardless. Like, I do still, I, I honestly think that she'd still be with Hiroshi, like, when she discovers he's still alive. But also, Hiroshi would just let her, you know, continue the relationship with Homeboy because it's only fair. Um, Which, uh, her work friend was really cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, um, like, he's like, and I'm so so yeah friend from work friend from work and and i love that right uh because and and i think kate softening on her mom is her realizing that like oh shit my mom knew she was doing this protect me because uh a a lot of times uh when uh in a successful co-parenting situation uh from what i've observed a lot of times what the mother will do um in in successful situations like this is that um the mother will often especially in the case of like if you have a daughter the mother will often very much protect the daughter's image of their father because Mm -hmm. it helps to foster a more positive relationship and healthier attitude towards men in the future um and i think that's definitely the strategy that kate's mom had going into this kind Mm -hmm. of speaking from my own experience studying uh family Um, dynamic and uh child psychology which uh back to family dynamics though uh one other thing Mm -hmm. that uh we didn't mention that i thought was interesting about kintaro is uh we we find out kate's thing is she's got not only survivor's guilt but also depression and also like a fear of intimacy before even all this stuff happens and we find out that Kintaru ha- even though his father has been majorly credited has a severe case of imposter syndrome. Yeah because because you know his dad has done all these great things and he's just an artist. Well, also is his art good enough? Yeah yeah. Is he good enough? Mm-hmm. And all of that. Yep. And does he deserve all this fame? Yeah I think that like I, I think that's really cool. And I like that uh, by the end of the season, like, Kentaro and Kate are on, like, a level playing field because mm-hmm. Kentaro now has experienced survivor's guilt and, like, that major bit of depression uh, after what happened to, to Kate and May. Yeah, in- indeed. And just clearly a lot of stuff happened because it was two years. Mm-hmm. Also, Which, let's talk that about... That was one the... thing that I... Uh-huh. I was just going to say. That was one of the things that I did didn't like about Kintaro is uh, how he kept holding on to the thing with him and May. Yeah, yeah. He was he was simping hard for a very uh-huh. long time, and like hard he, too long. it was weird because like dude's not blind. He sees what we see. Well, that is one of the things is because it was two years for him. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that helped. Yeah, separated for him. Yeah, because when he was talking about the people that died and everything his focus was on yep uh but yeah but yeah so um let's talk about uh, like the major star of this show (laughs) colonel leland lafayette shaw the third man which one both (laughs) let's talk about both so lee lee's a phenomenal character i Uh love this guy he feels Mm -hmm. like he is a protagonist ripped straight from a jules verne novel like this dude just like oozes 50 sci-fi pulp action hero. Yeah. Like, right down to the point of, like, his, like, just steel conviction, uh, you know, his unrequited love for uh, Keiko, which doesn't have to be unrequited anymore due to process of elimination, unless we find out Billy is actually alive, which we'll talk about in speculation. Well, it might be dead for a different reason. Oh? Because he's not there anymore. Ah, yeah. He on a other night. Well, no. Okay. A what? I must have gotten the 
confused again because I thought you were talking about the whole Keiko and Leland. No, I, I no, no I, yeah, I, I was talking about like Billy possibly being alive. Oh, well, so the, so the so, issue with that mm-hmm. is is now the possible age gap. I mean, because he's lived 30 years without her, 33, yeah. 33, 33 years without her, he's like a completely different person. Yeah, but I feel so, which is why I think, and I guess this will, will just jump into speculation here. I think we'll get John Goodman, Randa, to show yeah. up, and there's going to be a bit of a triangle, but I also think because of the theme of family, with Keiko being back, it'll reel Billy back and bring back the Billy that we saw in Monarch Establishment timeline, personality-wise, and like help him uh, reconnect with Hiroshi. Question. Mm-hmm. Triangle with who? Lee. Lee's not here Lee? anymore. Oh yeah, right. He died. I keep forgetting that he exploded. Yeah, yes. he, he went into the great nothing, man. My <laughs> bad. I forgot. I honestly, it slipped my mind that he exploded. That's my big, that was my, part of my big theory is, uh, I wonder if, uh, if, uh, th- for season two, we're switching out Kurt Russell for John Goodman. I could see that. But, oh, oh now I remember now. I remember my theory about, I remember my theory about Lee. So here's my thing, right? We talked about, uh, like Keiko mentions like gravity and and time distortions what if the mm-hmm. explosion didn't kill lee it just sent him forward in time mm, that would be interesting and so we get another timeline like another 20 years into the future with an older keiko john goodman and we got like older kate older kentaro and older may mm. huh maybe maybe because the whole entire thing is it seemed like it seemed like this whole movie was building up to king of monsters yeah yeah, and I definitely see that, like, like I, no, like, it was building I, it, up I, to uh, Godzilla versus Kong. It was building up to Godzilla versus Kong. Well, well, they got out in. I, I was gonna say that, but then I googled it, and they got, they came back, like after the two year skip mm-hmm. in uh, 2017. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Godzilla King of Monsters came out in because uh, I'm googling it so that I'm not talking out my ass. No problem. Mm-hmm. Godzilla King of Monsters came out in 2019. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Godzilla versus King Kong didn't come out until, what, 2021? I want to say it was 2020. Mm-hmm. So, this season but, but was like, building up. But wait, do we know what I, ye- I, I was going to say, do we know what year? Let me, do we know what year yeah. Godzilla versus King Like, did it take place the year it came out? Or did it, because... I thought it did. Cause... Because when they, when they were talking about G-Day, they were saying that it was the year that that movie came out. Let me see here. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, Keep talking. I'll Google. Yeah, but yeah. When they when they came out of I specifically remember when they came out of the Hollow Earth, they told them that it was 2017. Yes. It had been two years. Mm-hmm. Remember that too, Brian. Yep. And one of the things that uh, I also noticed that we all noticed actually is that Apex was the company that built Mecha G in Godzilla vs. Kong. Yes. So Flop. my five years after uh, the And I'm not saying that you're my, wrong. All I'm saying is that Apex was probably focused on building Mecha G and building a machine that big would take years to complete. When did? Yes. Okay. So what I was trying to say is that I think that season one was building up to God- Godzilla. I mean, bleh, Godzilla King of Monsters because they kept talking about how they expect something that was going to be like G Day, but on a massive scale. And, I'm not disagreeing then, there with like the main plot of King of Monsters, but they're also setting up the plot for Godzilla versus Kong in a yeah. separate. Oh, also, okay, now now, now that I've looked it what? up, now that I've looked it up, it looks like, it looks like King of Monsters w- was 20, uh, in, uh, like, timeline-wise, is 2015, and then mm. Godzilla vs. Kong is 2020. Godzilla, like, G-Day is 2014. Mm-hmm. So, timeline-wise, they already went through Ghidorah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so because, it's- because in the plot summary that I just read for uh, Godzilla vs. Kong, it says five, five years after the uh Ghidorah's attack so ah. that was king of monsters so it and it looks like it looks like Godzilla vs Kong does take place in 2020 so that means uh king of monsters had to have taken place in 2013 no or not 2013 uh 
2015. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they did they did when they came out of the thing say that uh, a lot happened. So oh yeah, yeah. I mean a lot yeah. could mean the whole Ghidorah thing, and they you know dealt with mm -hmm. it right because well, like, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and but definitely I, if we get a season two, it is gonna be probably more Kong like, focused. I I definitely yeah. think I mean it's clearly gonna be more Kong focused because I think season two is going to build up to Godzilla vs Kong, like Tony said, uh, and mm -hmm. I think how we got G Day yeah. as kind of the backdrop flashback for season one. I think in season two, what we're gonna instead of getting the flashback from Kate's perspective of G Day, like we got, we're gonna get King of Monsters flashbacks from Kentaro and Hiroshi. I would, oh. I think that would be a very interesting way of going about it because I think season two should be the machinations of Apex building, mm -hmm. Maybe. Mm -hmm. and maybe getting seed plants for uh, Godzilla vs Kong New Empire. And I mean, because because like think think about it logically, right? Now that we piece mm -hmm. together the timeline, uh, they get the data for Mecha Godzilla via information and data gleamed from King of Monsters. From, yeah, from Godzilla's fight with Ghidorah. Yeah. Yep. That. So it makes sense that present time we're building up towards Godzilla versus Kong, and then our flashback story because we're gonna continue that format is oh, yeah. uh, is seeing how Hiroshi, who predicted Ghidorah's invasion and Kentaro deal with Ghidorah's invasion. Mm -hmm. Yep. And also uh, and on we, the and, and we, side... And we, yeah, and we also know that uh, Hiroshi, Kentaro, and Kimmer work for mm -hmm. Apex now. So that's how Apex got all that data. Yep. yep. But also on the uh, Monarch side, because we didn't really cover it in mm -hmm. our recap, but uh, Monarch was a big part of it. Modern day Monarch. Yep. Mm -hmm. We will get to see how uh, Verdugo. Modern day Monarch. Is Damn it. I, watched, I watched those two movies back to back, so I, I'm slipping. I can't remember which one was with uh ken watanabe did he die in uh king of monsters he did mm -hmm. okay so we will get to see like the fallout from that because we never saw ken watanabe but his character was referenced yep so seeing the fallout of his character dying yeah and possibly maybe seeing his daughter in the show i think that would be, be cool. cool that would be cool because i don't think she was in godzilla versus the king godzilla vs kong nope but yeah i we, i definitely think i definitely think it's an interesting angle for sure um yeah and we see um, and we saw like not towards the end but we saw like Verdugo kind of like bringing Monarch into the light PR wise so mm -hmm. and and we saw a little bit of that in uh you know King of Monsters and uh, uh Godzilla versus Kong so we'll actually get to see how Monarch operates as a public organization mm -hmm. yeah also um we probably won't get to get to see too much of him because a he's getting very popular nowadays but also b because they probably can't afford daughter but it would be cool to see uh kyle chandler show up for a little bit yeah I, because oh, mm -hmm. i found out that the that uh he and uh billy are not going to be around the next one new empire ah. and the reason why they are is because for uh v she was promised a percentage of the revenue and if you remember that movie didn't do so well yeah and and so when it, it came around for doing new empire she had to chew either do new empire Empire or a third Enola home and the first two gave her like a big check oh yeah so that's why she's not gonna be in it anymore that kind of sucks because that means also Kyle Chandler's not gonna be in it and also probably her New Zealand friend yeah he's not gonna be in it that yeah. guy was funny he was funny um although I do know for a matter of fact that uh I forgot his name now but Tyrese mm -hmm. uh he's gonna still be in it the theorist who had his own uh podcast yeah I also want to just give a quick shout out since we're like in the wrap up stage to some of the best side characters of Monarch Kim mm -hmm. and Headphones shout out to both of y'all mm -hmm. you were great both both characters questioned them for a good chunk oh yeah then turned out to just be good people that were doing the wrong thing because they thought they were doing the right thing yeah like yeah it, it took a while for Tony to apologize to Tim uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I didn't trust that man I, I will be up front I didn't trust that man yep which uh we talked about like things we want to see in flashbacks mm -hmm. possibly probably like want to see his mentorship under Hiroshi because they talked about that yeah yeah well um, I, I I hope to also see more of 70s Billy uh which you know mm -hmm. piggybacks off of my Billy Returns plot line for Monarch mm -hmm. uh, and uh want to know more of uh what did you call her headphones uh, Timmy's partner oh oh Michelle Man yeah, Mademoiselle Mich uh, but her name is Michelle yeah yeah want to see more of her 
her. Yeah, because yeah, she's yeah, because she saved him. Yeah, we didn't Lady, see her in the end. Yeah, Lady I, Terminator. Yep. I think she. I think from. I think we can infer that she got captured by Kazakhstan police. Yeah. Or Monarch. Or Monarch. Or Monarch. Both are plausible. Yep. Like for all we know, she could be in one of those one of those windowless freaky cells. Oh yeah, but I can also see a possibility of since she was like part of Shaw's like anti Monarch resistance movement that she also like and because her and Timur were friends i think maybe i could i could totally see the possibility of tim recruiting her to uh, apex to help them out because mm -hmm. it basically kind of carries on shaw's legacy a little bit Which, as well mm -hmm. given her character and how she is i could see her just easily surviving that and just like slinking away when monarch and just like going into the shadows mm -hmm. buddy leave your sister alone she's sleeping and uh late in uh possible season two her just for the two years being off the radar and then coming to kate being like what the fuck like, bitch, what the Where's hell? Shaw? Right. I was following that man, and now he's gone. And also, I think this will lead to some uh, something really great that I think you know they've been building mm -hmm. up this entire time. I think eventually, like down the line, not I don't think in season two, but I think eventually, uh, Keiko, like Keiko, Billy, Kate, and Kentaro will eventually finally take what was owed to them and uh, like actually run Monarch for the better. Nice. Also, it doesn't need to happen. What I would like to see, maybe a love interest for Kintaro? Yeah, it's not Maybe necessary. someone that it's he not, met Yeah, it's not necessary. Over the two years? Yeah, it's not necessary, but I feel bad for the man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's been through some shit. He, he deserves some happiness. Mm -hmm. and, and been uh, through like, uh, another layer of shit that we don't even know. And like, it's gotta, it's gotta be hella awkward for him that his big sister is now gonna be more than likely banging his girl or his ex mm -hmm. that yeah. he clearly still had feelings for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, so but two years can change a lot. Oh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. anyway, final thoughts and ratings. Uh, we'll start with Tony. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to start with me. All right, then. Oh. Mm -hmm. Jay likes to flip it up. Oh, I know. <laughs> Excellent show. I may have my problems with some character decisions, but overall, everything made sense for the way the characters just act. And the overall twists and turns, it's this interesting look at the origins of an organization in the MonsterVerse that we may not have wanted, but I'm happy that we got. We definitely needed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if most people wanted it, but it was needed. I wanted it. Well, there's a lot of things that we want that the general public doesn't normally clamor for, Jay. Fair. I think we all... Mm -hmm. But with unique, complex characters, an interesting dynamic, and also how they use the various different titans in their own unique ways, because I will say this, the kaiju in this series were phenomenal. The third Thermal? Oh, intense. yeah. The thermal. Yeah, I love the thermal. And then we have, uh, what? We have the Ion Dragon, uh, the the flying boy that Big G fought at yep. the end. Yeah, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The, the one that fu fucked around and found out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the bugs. Oof. Oh, Ugh. Oh. Ugh. Ugh. But with all that, I want to give Monarch Legacy of Monsters a 9.5. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, I'll go next. So I'm going to go slightly lower than Tony. And I'm going to give Monarch a solid 9 out of 10. Because, look, the old, the thing that's holding it back to me, Hiroshi, open your damn mouth and explain the secret family. I still have questions that should have been answered in this goddamn season that aren't answered. Mm -hmm. and, and to be fair, my point five was for the, the Titans. Oh yeah, no, I feel that. I feel that. Work. Yeah. Well, they were used. Great. Everything else is still at that 9 range, but that point five. Gotta give it to the design department for those monsters. Oh, yeah, they no, look phenomenal. I understand. Not knocking you for it. But for me personally, that incompleteness I feel because a plot line that was brought up right at the beginning of the show was still never answered by the end pisses mm -hmm. me off. So, mm -hmm. given we it were that... with the character for like an episode and he never said anything. At all! Oh, and and Taro never asked! <laughs> True! That's another thing! Not. That's the other thing that pissed me off! Like, you're so upset with him! Why aren't we talking about the secret family, bro? Yeah. <sighs> but yeah, mm. so for that reason Season, I'm giving it a nine. Everything is fantastic about it. I want a season two like yesterday, but like Hiroshi, tell me about your secret family. I think just, I got it figured out, but I'd like to hear it from you. Just need a talk. Mm -hmm. But uh, Brian, final thoughts and ratings. 
like Jay said, there are minor things here and there that bring it down. Like the fact that we didn't get any answers. There were certain things that they should have talked about, but they never did. Like, I know we had the whole, like, fact that we were going fast and that it was Monarch who picked them up and saved them. But nobody had ever addressed the fact that uh, Kentaro was right in the Arctic yep. and that he saved all of them. Yep. They never really addressed that. Oh, oh also yeah. just uh, something that, not that it's not something that wasn't addressed, but something that I, I forgot to mention in speculation. I also feel like mm -hmm. in season two, if we get it, uh, we will get closure between uh, Kate and her ex. Uh, like, Hopefully. I think both yeah. will have been, not, I think both will have been moved on and they'll they'll finally get to have that conversation. Well, I mean, remember also for Kate's ex, it's been two extra years. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And yeah, I agree. And there's a lot of things that I could see them doing. And, and also, I think it's technically three because, you know, G-Day was a year was a, a year prior to the events well, of... Uh, I was saying that her ex had two extra days than uh, Kate. Yeah, two, yeah, two yeah, extra years, yeah. Yeah, because Kate was in the time dilution. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. But yeah. And the breakup between her and her ex happened on G-Day. Yep. Yeah, but yeah. Okay. So there are little things here and there. Like, somebody else pointed this out to me, but there are times where it just feels like things are going too fast. Yeah. And so for those little minor things, it's still a fantastic show. So uh, I'm going to have to break our old school trend and uh, agree with Dr Jay here and go for a nine myself. I mean, it's still yeah. technically the original trend. It, we're, still, we're still a point. With Tony. Oh, yeah, we're still a point below somebody on the panel. So point five. Point. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> so. Well, well, Tony, if you listen to those classic before you came on Channel Chasers, there were a lot of times where I gave something just a point five above where Jay did. It happened. Oh, yeah. It happened like eighty five percent of the time. Well, yeah, I'm aware of that. Yep. But the, the, the only times that we agreed with each other was when somebody else was on the panel. <laughs> Funny enough, like every time Cap was on, it was like slightly higher than Cap. Yeah. Like that was so funny when we had Cap on for a uh, Young Justice, which uh, never got recorded because it's a Twitch only. Yep. I believe. Yep. But uh, yeah, yeah. Jay and I gave it, I think, an eight. Yeah, we gave it an eight, and we were able to talk Cap up to a seven point. Five. Yeah. Oh my. Yep. Oh my plan. Yep. But, but yeah. Hopefully, unlike that, we won't have these unanswered questions, and that they'll get us even to and answer the damn questions. Please, please, Apple. Please. Uh, but yeah. So we're moving on from giant monsters to giant bitches. Yep. Brian. We. Let's tell the folks at home what we'll be covering. Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, quote the Monty Python. Now for something completely different. We are trading in the literal monsters for metaphorical mom. because next week we are heading to the theaters and we are getting musical mean girls it's gonna be pretty fetch if you ask me i I'm think trying they... to make fetch a thing no i think th no i think they actually made it happen man i think they made it happen this time it counts we'll when... talk about it but i think they made yeah, it happen i think you're delulu as fuck <laughs> we'll find out and, next uh, week on quote. channel chasers but until then hope you guys stay safe out there you know pay attention to the early warning system be careful of monster attack hope Hopefully you'll stay safe long enough to see us on another episode of the Channel Chasers podcast. Peace. Peace.